So here we are again on this beautiful, wonderful Sunday evening, and, as has been the case over the past few weeks, it's serial time. So, I'm returning to one of the series that are ongoing on the channel, and delivering a new episode like I've done over the past few Sundays. Now recently, we've seen uh, the return of Breach, and also my organisation deals with all things paranormal. So. With that in mind, I think I'm going to mix it up this week and return to The Wanderer's Diary. Yes, our post-apocalyptic world. So, once again, my dear friends, it's time to relax on this beautiful Sunday and listen. Day 40. I found Marv Spot. It's a sort of bay in a ditch, a bit to the west of the proposed North Gates location. It wasn't hard to find, and I wasn't alone there. It seems this place has established itself as the city beach already. Even though fuller than anticipated, it was nice. Otherwise, an uneventful day. I ate dinner with Dave and told him about the place. He already knew. Being part of the scouts, apparently, also means that you'll be eternally out of the loop. Day 41. Today our group was assigned to fence duty again. But I have to say, we are making very fast progress. I'd say we already have a third of the perimeter fenced, and both the south and east gate are already standing, with a fancy guard tower each. Corbin didn't join us for the whole day. He was off with the council and other scout leaders discussing an expedition to Blaster's secondary mining camp. It's to the south of here, across a fairly big plain. The journey should take two days and a bit of change each way, and who knows how long to take stock of all the goodies down there. So, the first trip is planned to last a week, just taking inventory and all. Depending on the results, proper scavenging runs would follow. The part that was being discussed was which groups would take part in the expedition and how the camp was to be searched, and for what we were to look. The council is very busy at the moment, so we didn't expect a decision today. But tomorrow we are to stand by for possible deployment. Corbin's way of saying, let's skip work tomorrow. Day 42. We were standing by at the barracks slash armory today, and were shooting the shit together. Well, not shooting anything. We do have to conserve ammo, after all. Speaking of which, the council is also thinking about sending scavengers back to Cayman to get more ammo, as well as establishing a weapons workgroup tasked with constructing crossbows and the likes to avoid material dependency. Day 43 Apparently, Corbin got called before the council late yesterday evening and assigned to the recon mission into the secondary camp. Another scout group, led by some Peter I've never met before, will be our backup. And so, well, that's that. Oh, and two other groups will head for Cayman the day after tomorrow. The council seems to have been in a decisive mood yesterday. We were stocking up on rations today, coordinated with the other group, of course, and set out to get ourselves material specialists for the trip. Tom will be coming along again, given his uh, travel expertise, as well as a uh, Chelsea and Morton representing the techies and workshops each. With our fellowship assembled, we will begin our journey tomorrow. Day 44 Today was another easy day. Yeah, we walked all through it, but whatever. The terrain was light except for the first two hours or so. Well, a forest isn't what I'd call heavy terrain, but well, after that, it was only flat meadows. Some small groups of trees here and there, the odd brook every kilometre or so. It was a relaxing journey too. The weather was sunny and calm, not scaldingly hot, ideal for marching. Peter's guys were all right, and our specialist detachment was in a good mood, and also no hindrance in terms of speed. Our camp tonight is on one of these mini forests, and given our numbers, night watch shifts won't be too long. Day 45 Another easy day on the meadows. Nothing of note happened today, and in my mind, it already begins to fall together with yesterday. We even camped in a similar mini-forest as yesterday. 
Day 46 We arrived at the secondary mining camp in the late morning. Its structure seemed similar to New Blaster's, of course discounting our own modifications. I think they may actually be the same construction patterns. It would make sense, at least. The site as a whole is maybe one third of New Blaster in size, but it has only one less blast furnace. Many buildings are damaged well beyond what exposure and time alone would do to them. Well, the looks of it, I'd say storm damage and the others agree. But given the geography, that is just a tad unlikely. And a storm strong enough to knock down the chimneys of two blast furnaces would leave some traces in Old Blaster too, or at least in the immediate surroundings. But no, everything looks nice. We explored the whole site over the course of the day with Peter's group forming a vanguard, clearing buildings ahead of time in case of lurking chasers or any other predators. As afraid as we may be of the old leather hides, a bear would definitely be a problem too. We and the specialists comb through the buildings cleared by Peter's guys, writing up anything interesting. In the early evening, we made camp in the main shelter. Tom, Chelsea and Morden are currently discussing what parts they want to inspect more closely tomorrow, and what we could reasonably take with us now, on a small-scale supply run, and on a proper dismantling expedition, respectively. Knowing nothing of these worlds of technology, we lowly peasants are currently doing something much more useful. Making dinner. One of Peter's guys is originally from an era way down south, so we insisted on making a hot pot, now that we have time to do so. And it was a good bit of work, but oof, it already smells delicious. Day 47. Yesterday's sightseeing list was quickly checked out, and Morton was especially happy. We took a closer look at the on-site forge, and in his words, we could rip that thing and all its bits out and double our output back home. I don't know why, but I have the vague feeling a large expedition is coming up in the not-too-distant future. We were on the move again around noon, back through the meadows again, and naturally, we may camp in one of the mini forests. I want to say it's the same as on the first journey, but well, I don't know for sure. Like the good old boys and girls we are, we set up our radio in time for the transmission window like every day. But this time we actually caught something. The Cayman party had apparently uncovered some kind of hint that a small hamlet roughly east of our position originally had a large stable with a lot of horses. Unlikely as their continual survival may be, one of our two scout groups was to split off and search for them. And like the experts we are, we decided with a match of rock, paper, scissors. Best of three, like any sane adult would do. We lost. So we are going. Peter's going to escort the specialists and what little loot we took home, in, and in turn, we keep the radio. Apparently we'll get reinforced on site by an ex-horse trainer named Michelle originally part of a second Cayman group, who is now looping back on us. We said our goodbyes in the morning and headed east, as we ordered and reached the woods by maybe eleven o'clock. A nice change of pace, considering our last few days. It also makes you realise how out of cover you are in just grass. Oh, eerie. Well, supposedly we'll hit a creek some day tomorrow. If it has a service road alongside it, the hamlet is south. If not, north. Easy enough. Day 49. We reached the Promised Creek early on, without a service road, and so north we followed it. And there it was. Judging by the size of the houses, or mansions really, and the size of the overall estates. I guess this was some woodlands escape for the rich way back when. It seemed untouched at least. Our first loot run did not yield any horses, but some knick-knacks and rations. Given that Michelle will probably arrive tomorrow evening, we should try to find the horses sometime tomorrow. If they're still around, that is. Day 50 We spotted four horses today. They looked okay, I guess. Long legs, long face, sad expression, a tail. That's what they're supposed to look like, right? Michelle linked up with us in the early evening, but 
didn't get a good look at the animals, so we have to wait until tomorrow. Day 51. Good news. Michelle made contact with the pack herd, <laughs> whatever, and she thinks they can be tamed again. And they're in good health, too. She said to give her a day or two to get them accustomed to humans again. So, we'll plunder tomorrow, and maybe the day after that, too. Day 52. Going through a rich guy's house, taking what you want. <laughs> I think every kid has thought about that at least once. And now we're living the dream, with little to show for it. Turns out, except for money and pomp, there's not much in there. No tools, no foods that held until now. Just art and cars that are all more than you'd ever want to see. Well, that's not entirely true. There are at least some usable things. Mainly gardening tools and kitchen appliances. As well as some bed frames robust enough to, well, to still exist. While we can only carry a fraction of all that ourselves, we used our time to create a concentrated stockpile so later parties can come and get a move on more quickly. Oh, and fancy wines. Yeah, we found a ton of those. General Scout, as well as our own policy, is no alcohol outside home. So we didn't drink any, but we stuffed our pockets as good as we could and brought the rest to the stockpile. Day 53 Today we continued our stockpiling of yesterday, and even found a wagon. Like, old-style horse-drawn wagon. <laughs> I guess we found the house of the owner of the horses. It was damaged, but we managed a makeshift repair, and since we'll return via the service road and the 34 anyway, we'll be able to carry much of the stockpile ourselves. And with all that wine, I smell a festival coming up. Michelle also had good things to say today. The horses while alone for more than a decade, are not really feral. We can take them with us tomorrow, and even trust them with the wagon, so everything works out perfectly. Day 54 Man, I want a banjo right now. We were on the road the whole day. Two horses on the wagon, two loaded up like donkeys, us walking along. I don't know for sure, but but I'd say we're carrying the better part of a ton in wine, silver, and whatever around now. And at that normal walking speed. The camp was unusual today, with the wagon making for a proper table, and the horses around us, and all that. <laughs> yeah, as I said, I want a banjo, or at least banjo music. Day 55. We reached Old Blaster today. And while we could easily push on home, we stayed and searched the southern edge of town. No looting parties have gone there yet, so we expected good finds. Rightly so, too. But now I really fear that the wagon will just break under the weight. Whatever. Only maybe two hours to go tomorrow. Day 56 Our return was glorious. The wine alone may have improved the mood in town by a good bit. But the horses? We won't get any closer to a truck than this. Peter's group unsurprisingly returned almost a week ago, delivering the infantry they'd made, and now we bring in what carrying capacity we were missing. All pieces for a big recovery of the secondary camp tools were now in place. Given our extended absence and great success, we were given off not only today but also tomorrow. I went to the beach again, where I met Dave. He's become our resident fisherman, constructing nets a bit down from the bathing spot. While his leg may be healed fully now, he's still not too eager to go out into the woods again. So he joined the town guard, but since they don't do much on most days, a fisherman it is. Oh, and apparently we now have a school too. Actually, that's not really surprising. We have a lot of kids in town. While it may be called a school... I doubt they'll learn literature or history there. Handcrafting and general survival would be more useful subjects. Day 57 I visited said school today. From what I've been told there, the kids have to come every day. But don't get homework, or do anything that screams school to me. It's more like a trainee program. Yeah, they're taught writing and basic math and all that, but... 
but mostly the teacher, Karen. Just grab someone from any job she can get her hands on and they do a show and tell. Seems like a good system to me. And since that system is based around other people being able to spare time, it's highly flexible. Karen was delighted when I came by and offered to do a Navigation 101, even though today was supposed to be reading writing practice. Since the area around us is quite easy to navigate, just by memory, we couldn't do any actual navigating, but I taught them the tips and tricks that I myself found out by just doing it for a while. And while I wouldn't trust them out there, even without considering them possibly being eaten by whatever, I think they learned something today. Day 58. I thought things were going too well lately. In the wee hours of the morning, the returning second Kaiman group reported spotting a thrasher on the 34 behind them. They don't think it saw them, but it was there all right. So today all scouts and town guards available, as well as some construction guys, were assembled and briefed on our friendly new neighbour. The plan is to set up a defensive line in the woods before Old Blester. The Kaiman party is to observe the thing until we're finished, and then lure it here. If all goes well, we will have slain our potential downfall. And if not, well, we won't have time for regret. Preparations were done in a hurry, and we set out by early evening. The main force, including us, is camping on the edges of Old Blester, but a small survey party, including some of the builders, are currently looking for some good trees to use. Day 59 The surveyors found a good patch of sturdy, tall trees, maybe 200 metres south of the 34. The main force arrived sometime in the morning, and we began to set up shooting galleries and platforms. The construction may take a while, but considering the height in which we need to build, I think we're making good progress and our armament is nothing to scoff at. A rifle or shotgun for everyone, some improvised incendiary grenades, and some crazy genius managed to concoct some acid in a resistant pot that we'll try to dump on the fucker. And somehow, from somewhere, we even managed to produce a machine gun. A big one. According to Marv, it's an M1919. The reason why nearly nobody knew we had that is its ridiculous ammo consumption which would be tempting but wasteful against anything except a thrasher. The observers reportedly dump their cargo and maintain their distance. The thrasher is just lumbering about, not moving significantly, and it seems to be missing one of its flails. Well, five can still do enough damage. Day 60 the defensive works are done, and we'll engage the thrasher first thing in the morning. The observers are already informed. We've set up six walkways and five regular firing platforms, as well as a big one for the 1919, and one a bit ahead for the acid. The acid one is deliberately obvious and exposed, so that the observers will easily find it and run beneath it. And once the thrasher follows them below it, Jeff, now only called the acid man, or trigger the release from further up the tree. I expect to sleep bad tonight, but I thought so the previous nights too, and I was under like a rock. Whatever. The logistic guys even cleared some coffee for us to be on high alert tomorrow morning. Apparently, it'll be super effective, considering our decade-long withdrawal. <laughs> Let's see about that. Day 61 the coffee kicks hard. Oh, super hard, I mean. If all went to plan, the observers shot the thrasher a few minutes ago and are dragging it here. Since it can barely make more than walking pace, we'll expect its arrival in two and a half hours, give or take. But still, we are all up in our crow's nests already, armed to the teeth and spoiling for a fight. I at least can clear my mind by writing this, but the others are tense, anxious. In a good way, though, I think. Writing this gives me some sense of closure, to be honest. Not that I plan on dying, but it is well in the range of possibility. And if we come out of this alive, we'll be heroes. We are heroes. 
The observers came running in the forenoon, sweaty and panting, but not completely KO. A quick shadow report told us they'd fired all they had into the thrasher, suspecting one or two good hits. The thrasher didn't give us enough time to talk longer. At first we only heard it push through the brush, and then it emerged. Large like an elephant, covered in brown armour, lazily throwing about its five remaining flails. As planned, we held fire until the observers could lure it under the acid platform. For a moment, we could only hear the slight flush of the reddish-brown concoction, hitting the shell of the beast. Then came the shrieks. I'd never heard a thrasher before, and only seen one through field glasses, so I expected a bellow or roar. But the thrasher's scream sounded like a mix between a mountain lion and shearing steel. Before we could even see what our opening act achieved, the machine gun went off and with its rhythm of destruction in our ears, we took our shots. While a thrasher is usually moving slowly, when you get their blood pumping, they get fast. It closed the distance from the acid platform to beneath the 1919 in maybe four seconds, nearly trampling the observers who weren't running again. With a thrasher this close, it began whipping the trees with its flails. Luckily, it couldn't reach the platforms, but... But given enough time, oh, it would soar through the whole tree. Throwing itself around as it did and shooting up splinters wherever it reached the thrasher didn't make it easy on us. I'd say maybe every twenty shots one made it into the weak point of its armour. And even then we needed to shoot off two flails and a leg for it to finally stop moving. And there it lies now, below us, bleeding out. We'll wait until evening to leave the safety of the trees, but we radioed town already, informing them of our victory. We expected an all-or-nothing situation, and we got one. Not one life lost today, but plenty of wounded due to the wooden shrapnel. In anticipation of such a situation, we brought three medics with us who are now treating the severely wounded. I myself got hit too, but only slightly mostly on my forearms and hands. And now we rest in our newly won safety, with no desire to head home. Personally, I couldn't even be bothered to climb down this tree today. The Wanderer's Diary continues. So, so what have I got lined up for next Sunday? Well, I think I'll put it to a vote again, so, so make sure you click on the community tab on my uh, channel page, because there'll be a vote on which series you want me to continue. You want more Breach? You want this story to continue? Do you want the uh, guy in the Navy to continue? Oh, so many choices. But I guarantee one thing. There will be another series on Sunday next week. <laughs> well, until then, well, I'll be back tomorrow, won't I? So, tomorrow. Yes. Till then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>